But anyway, it's a, a real pleasure to be here in Dublin today, and thank you very much um, also to the board uh, of the Institute for inviting me. I'm delighted um, to be here also at a relatively opportune moment in terms of a discussion on democracy in the European Union with the uh, pending European Parliament uh, elections right across Europe, as we all know. Um, I'm actually um, sort of deliberately um, chose to focus on the national parliaments rather than on the European Parliament, uh, because at this particular moment in European integration, I think um, it's especially salient more than ever and across a, a broad range of institutions and actors that in fact it's crucial uh, in terms of um, improving in any way the, de the democratic deficit that national parliaments also engage with the European Union and in a sense, and I think that's also one of my conclusions, take national ownership uh, to some extent at least of what's going on. Now what I'm saying doesn't mean that I believe that the European Parliament has no role or that it's not in some ways doing, uh, doing good work. I'm not saying that at all, and I will um, come back to that at the very end um, to, to dwell on that, and then I hope in questions um, that, because a lot of this, if, if, for me, it's very much about both the European Parliament and the national parliaments in terms of uh, the future of democracy in the European Union. Um, and I think it's a, it's a salient topic. In fact, I'm doing research at the moment that is looking at um, the role of presidents of a number of the important, what I call, executive actors in the European Union uh, in terms of being held to account or engaging in a process of information giving and dialogue. Um, and in that sense, um, of course, and, and that's haphazard, um, that the, the fact that Jean-Claude Trichet yesterday uh, refused uh, to come before the uh, banking committee of the Oireachtas, I think, you know, figures in that bigger picture, and we can, if you like, come back to that, um, or I may refer to it as we go along. Um, so that's basically the, the general background for my talk. I think I'll, I'll start, oh yeah, no, I have to do it here, sorry, <laughs> wait a moment. Skip that. Um, in fact, I get the, the title of um, the talk was um, uh, are na deliberately provocative, but also rhetorical. Are national parliaments uh, behind the loop, and does it matter? And basically, um, we can answer that very quickly. Yes, they are behind the loop, and yes, it does matter. And of course, the ultimate question is, well, what should one do about that in what context? So I hope that my talk will provide at least some meat for a further uh, and deeper discussion on that issue. Uh, and not I'll do my best not to be too academic about it. Um, well, I think one of the phenomenon in the European Union that we're living in today, which in fact is post-crisis, obviously post the Lisbon Treaty, but also post various crisis measures um, that have been taken, is one where the executive power dominates. And, and if, if the executive power dominates, then obviously parliaments don't, and parliaments um, are have a much weaker position. That's the, the implication. Um, and in terms of executive dominance, um, we have various actors at the, um, at the European Union level um, but I th my belief is we can't anymore be simplistic in the way that we describe the nature of these actors. Um, we can't describe even the European Commission as only supranational nowadays. We can't describe the European Council or the Council of Ministers as being mainly intergovernmental. They're both intergovernmental and supranational. Uh, the European Central Bank is obviously also supranational. So um, th this is a kind of a, a change in, in our thinking. And this has to do with the powers, the new powers and tasks that have been acquired by these um, various actors. In particular, and that's going to be my emphasis today, post-crisis. And I think one of the fundamental things and why the role of the national parliaments is so important is that it's often forgotten that in crucial um, institutions, European Council is now, since the Treaty of Lisbon, an institution at the European level. It's the national executives 
that are it's composed of the national executives, both the European Council and the Council of Ministers. So that means, and that's also stressed in the Treaty of Lisbon, the lines of accountability are also very much for those national ministers and the national uh, prime minister to the national level. At the same time, of course, these actors, institutions, um, have powers and responsibilities at the European level. So for the collectivity of the actor, there has to be accountability also at the European level. And that means the European Parliament. And it's the only, um, it doesn't mean only the European Parliament, of course. Uh, but if you're talking about political accountability, then it is the European Parliament. You can have other kinds of supranational uh, accountability, for example, legal accountability to the European Court of Justice, you know, if cases come before it and are justiciable before it, uh, that's one kind. It can also be more administrative um, kind of accountability, not unimportant, for example, the European um, Ombudsman. Uh, come back to that maybe later. But in any event, this is sort of the broader um, palette, if you like, of the important key actors. Now, admittedly, we had a discussion also at lunchtime. The actors are of, a, are of different nature. Eh? So you have the highly political European um, Council, the equally political in many ways Council of Ministers. Um, you have the traditionally less political European Commission, although I don't think um, that's necessarily true anymore. And you have the European Central Bank that many would describe as a more technocratic uh, kind of actor, a sort of expert-based actor, no, is, is certainly not meant to be a political actor. It's supposed to be removed precisely um, from the uh, political domain. And what I put in at the end, um, what we see happening in recent years also is an accentuated role for the presidents of these institutions. In fact, all four of them. Now, the Council of Ministers, as we know, rotates. But the others, the European Council and even the Euro Summits, uh, which is the Eurozone-specific um, uh, European Council, if you like, um, uh, the European Commission and the European Central Bank, those three presence, presidents um, are, are very prominent, have been very institutionalized. And we do see the presidents on behalf of the institutions coming more and more to give account uh, to the European Parliament, but also increasingly to the national parliaments. And I think the latter is in particular um, important. OK, let me move on. And um, um, I just keep an, an eye on the, on the time. But let me move on to say, well, what I'm not talking about today, that's perhaps because one, one talks about the role of national parliaments uh, in general. Um, one, ref one is inclined to think, well, what is their role it, traditionally in the European Union in terms of legislation um, and um, their involvement in, 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 in that sense? And that's important, um, but it's only a small part of what the European Union does nowadays. It's actually numerically also a very small part. It's not unimportant, certainly not. You know, we've seen there has been very important legislation, the two-pack legislation, the six-pack legislation that were both adopted recently are, 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 are crucial legislative instruments. Um, but it's only a small part of, of, of what is happening. But even if we look at um, the the role of the national parliaments in terms of legislation, and we can come back to this maybe in the discussion if there's an interest in it. In the Lisbon Treaty, the national parliaments were given uh, more of a role in that sense, in the sense that they could um, a a provide a kind of a subsidiarity check uh, on legislation, and they could, co you know, they could network together with a number of national parliaments, and they could try and prevent legislation being ad adopted at an early uh, stage was kind of called the early warning mechanism. That's part of the legislative procedure. In practice, um, that has been a highly problematic um, procedure. And, so, and some people will say, you know, when you think about the role of the national parliaments in the future of the European Union, we need to think about um, reforming um, that procedure and, you know, making it a red card or a green card or 
you know, that sort of thing and maybe change the conditions slightly. And I think, well, yes, that's fine. You can certainly discuss how you can improve that uh, procedure, but that's only a tiny part of what's necessary in terms of a role, you know, a more accentuated role for national um, parliaments and, and a very limited one of that in that respect. One of the problems in terms of legislation, and then I'm going to leave this topic, um, in terms of also the involvement of national parliaments uh, on the legislation that is being adopted at the European level, is that over 80% of legislative instruments in the last parliamentary term uh, were adopted according to the, um, in what are known as trialogue meetings before the first reading in Parliament. So basically that means behind closed doors, representatives of the European Parliament, of the Council of Ministers, uh, and of the Commission, because the Commission initiates um, the legislation, they agree and negotiate as if it were a sort of diplomatic agreement almost, uh, the provisions of the legislation, and that's agreed and then only um, is adopted um, as a legislative instrument. Now, aside from the issue of secrecy and the lack of public debate um, on in crucial issues of, of legislation, this also means that national parliaments are out of the loop at a, at a certain stage because they don't know. Their minister might not even know because it's representatives of the council that are actually in the trialogue meetings. So there is a, a discord there. We can talk about that more if there's, if there's interest. But what I really wanted to focus on um, is the non, what is actually formally called in the Treaty of Lisbon, the non-legislation, um, that's actually used as a formal term to refer to more implementing acts and delegated legislation, but it can be used much in a much wider sense to refer to everything, all the rules and norms that are adopted by the European Union that are not of a legislative nature. And legislation is quite specifically, for the first time, defined in the um, Lisbon Treaty. And that's obviously crucial um, in areas such as the European semester, which is now about to be, you know, right now actually, so important in the Irish context, but also in terms of what the European Central Bank is doing, foreign policy, international agreements, etc. cetera. Uh, oh yeah. So let me, so, oh, sorry. Gosh, I knew I got that wrong. Okay, now I have to go back. Um, Okay, these are just uh, tables. I'm focusing basically in my talk on three actors, the European Council, the Commission, and the European Central Bank. And you see they're of a d traditionally regarded as being of a, um, a different nature. This is basically just the broader frame in terms of accountability. And all you really need to focus on is just the existence um, of this frame. And I'm only focusing on the democratic um, element and, uh, you know, traditionally, the thinking would be, well, the European Council is composed of the prime ministers of member states, so the accountability should only be at the national domain. Um, and that's not entirely the case anymore, because there is also some very limited accountability at the European domain. And the supranational um, would traditionally be... Th this is the importance, really, of the European parliamentary elections. It's the relationship between the Commission and the uh, European Parliament, because that's the most developed at the supranational level in terms of political accountability um, for the Commission. But with the changing powers of the Commission, particularly in the European semester processes, um, and the, um, if you like, the manner in which the European Commission acquires powers over, you know, such the national budgets, basically, and over the, the parameters with, within which they take place, the national part, the issue of Commission accountability to national parliaments must become particularly crucial. The European Central Bank isn't developed there, but I can say something about that later. I'm going to go on quite quickly um, and this is basically restating um, um, the, the same thing that the, the, that the, based the European Council, who, who it should be accountable to, and the Commission. Let me go on quite quickly on this. 
just to be, you know, as a scholar, we like to be precise um, in terms of, well, what do we mean by accountability? It's an often a very overused term, and it's good to think about conceptually what, what we think about it. I have done empirical work together with political scientists where we used a definition that's broad enough um, uh, to embrace different kinds of accountability, including political accountability, you know, a relationship between an actor and a forum. It can be any actor, any forum, and there are three basic elements, an obligation to explain and justify questioning and the fact that there may face consequences. It doesn't have to be legal sanctions. Uh, this is just put in a different way. The three different components to accountability, information, debate, and some sort of consequence. Consequence is deliberately um, meant to be a sort of weaker uh, way uh, of expressing that. And I think you know, this is something also that applies both at the European level and um, at the national level. Um, in particular, information, do parliaments, be they national or European, do they get the information they need uh, on time and in a complete fashion? or at least do they have access to that? And in that context, um, the access they get, and I, this is something that I hope will come back in the, in the questions, the access to information they get um, from their own government is particularly important. Are they getting access to, direct access to, for example, the databases, the government databases with all the uh, EU information, including limited information, which is so-called limited information, which is meant to cover kind of internal information work that is in progress. It's actually used, um, I th the, the figures, I think of something like 60% of all non, or even more, of all non-public information is, is limited. That means it's non-public. But are parliaments getting, at, you know, are getting access to that? And under what conditions? Some parliaments are, some national parliaments are, some aren't. The European Parliament is. When they get access to that, to, to, to that are they, must they keep it um, secret? And who sets these rules on what national parliaments uh, need to do with this information? Is, and it is, in fact, the Council of Ministers. But it's not through legislation that has been publicly debated. It's, in fact, through the internal rules of the Council of Ministers uh, based on its own rules of procedure that are then applied more widely by, basically by all the actors and institutions. in the, uh, And this is a key issue, in my view, because information um, is key to any kind of accountability process. If you don't have, you know, the raw information, even if you have to keep it secret as a parliament, you know, even if there are constraints in the way it can be used, um, it's very hard to engage in any kind of an accountability process, which are the subsequent um, stages. All right. Um, I'm conscious of the time. How long more do I have? Well, no, I think there was an agreement oh, sorry, that I would... The oh, right, yeah, so, yeah, so. yeah. No, I won't keep going until two. No, I, mean, <laughs> I like to have a debate and dialogue. It's all very well to give information, but uh, okay, I'll go on for a maximum another 10 minutes. All right, so basically what I thought I would do is focus what I have been saying on the European semester, um, because I think that's, you know, it's crucial in, in all the member states, but I think in particular perhaps in the Irish context where Ireland having just exited the program and for the first time being involved in the, in the European semester process. You can hardly read this, yeah. Sorry, this was actually from the European Parliament's um, website, which actually was the most complete in terms of the description. And the reason I'm doing this, I'm showing it like this, you don't need to see all the different um, details, but you see the different actors that are involved in the European semester. So it's not only the European Commission, as we might be inclined to think. Very important at crucial moments is the role of the Council, in particular the Eurogroup, also the European um, Council. So it's not only the Commission, even if the Commission has a very important um, uh, role at different moments and at very key moments. Um, and actually one of the very key moments is right now, 
um, in May when it's defining also the draft country-specific uh, recommendations. That's of crucial importance, obviously, um, for the national budgets. Um, and they will subsequently be adopted by the Council and endorsed ultimately by the European Council. Now, the reason I include this particular version of the European semester, um, because it does actually show, I think, quite neatly, and it's from the European Parliament, both the, the, where the European Parliament can be involved in the process, but also that there is a role for the national parliaments. Um, and I think if you think about the logic of this, what is actually being dealt with um, at, and decided at the European uh, level concerning um, the specifics of national budgets, then it's totally obvious and rational that the national parliaments must also be involved. And basically, and I've, I'm, I've started studying this a bit empirically because we do have some uh, data at this point because it's the fourth time uh, for many countries that the European semester has been in operation, so there is um, some evidence, if you like, that, that's available. Um, but you basically see, even from this diagram, that there is a very limited involvement of parliaments. Um, but there's not no involvement, but there is a limited involvement. Now, the European uh, Parliament, it's the most developed, and I'll come to that in a moment. Um, you see that there is some debate and a resolution on the semester and the country-specific recommendations. Um, and there is something new called the European Parliamentary Week, which is in pink, um, the box at the end in the middle. And that's a new initiative in this context. It's kind of interparliamentary, engaging both the European Parliament and the national parliaments. And so that's something new that is emerging um, um, and it's interesting to look and see whether that, what sort of form and flesh that's been given. And there's economics dialogues going on with the EU institutions and member states. And basically this involves the so-called uh, Euro Commissioner, uh, Olli Rehn, um, going to the committee in question, the Economic and Monetary Committee of the European Parliament, and engaging in a dialogue um, with the European Parliament. Let me move on from this. So you see, um, and this is on the basis of some empirical work of, you, you see that the Euro com um, Commissioner, Olli Rehn, in, in particular, goes to the European Parliamentary Plenary, gives some information. There is some dialogue, but not very much, because it's on the basis of a set speech, um, and there is little direct um, reaction to the questions that are put. So if you um, analyze it in terms of accountability, you can conclude basically fairly quickly that it's not very demanding um, for the uh, executive actor in question. If you look at what's happening in terms of the economic dialogue before the Economic and Monetary Committee of the European Parliament, um, there is um, more information being given than in the plenary sessions. And um, there is some d dialogue and answering of uh, debate, but again, it's, it's also relatively limited and within um, strict time limits. And you, know, you can also wonder, well, does that resonate more widely? That's, of course, a, a bigger question. Um, you know, I had a research assistant who helped me, who plowed through all this information, who listened to online videos, some of which weren't translated. And, and you know, so it's a bit of a struggle to, to extract um, the information. So this is not something that's easily accessible uh, you know, to the public, to national parliaments, um, or whatever. Um, you do see, um, in terms of the practice before national parliaments, there is a practice of, for example, Oli Wren coming to he has come to a certain number of national parliaments. I think it was about six altogether in this period of almost four years. But again, it's, it tends to be more, more of a general nature. In fact, um, Catherine Day came recently to the Erachtus um, uh, earlier this year in, in that sort of capacity explaining the European semester and, um, but you know, and it was interesting, but it was, it all remains rather general 
And it's, it's certainly not a question where the executive is really being challenged in a way um, that matters. Um, and there have been some national parliaments are changing their practices as a result of um, these initiatives. We've seen that also with regard to, which I won't have time to go into um, today, the, the importance of the European Council meetings. There has been a change of practice by certain national parliaments um, in the sense that they are um, having plenary debates before the European Parliament's uh, take, uh, sorry, before the European Council meetings take place. They happen in, uh, they are in public, so there might also be, uh, the, the media will possibly engage with it depending on the salience of the issue, but for European Council meetings, they tend to be, you know, the important milestones and where the European Union is going, be it banking union or whatever. So certain national parliaments are um, changing, um, are changing their practices. But often they all struggle, and we see there have been a number of recent reports, um, not only in the UK where there's been both a House of Commons report and a House of Lords report, but also in, in other um, jurisdictions, we see that the national parliaments all s struggle with not getting the information they need um, on time um, from their own governments or otherwise, but it generally needs to be from their own government. Um, and if they do, uh, for example, the Danish and Finnish and, and even the, the Germans, I'll come to that in a moment, um, do get the information they need, but they, they have to discuss it and debate it behind closed doors, so there can't be any public um, public translation of that. So basically, um, I think one of the issues that needs to be thought of, about more profoundly um, is the issue that I would call of national ownership um, of certain processes. I mean, you know, of course, to the extent that it's possible, one shouldn't be um, unrealistic about these things, but I think that's part of the process that, um, and this is a, um, a proposal by the Danish parliament um, from last year, that there needs to be an adaptation of the national budgetary processes um, to what's happening in Europe, so that um, the national actors, the government and the parliaments, the national parliaments, can really, that there can be a discussion by national parliaments in a manner to influence their own government prior to the European decisions being taken and at the crucial um, moments. And that needs to begin quite early on. And that can have implications for the way in which the national budgetary process um, go, goes. For example, in the Netherlands, uh, they're now debating moving um, the adoption of the budget to a different time to be more in parallel with what's happening um, at the European level. That's just one example, but I think that's the kind of debate that we need to have. So how do you match what you're having to follow at the European level, but how can you um, make the role that can be played by national parliaments in particular um, more effective? I'm switching a little bit here, but I, this is also a little bit a theme of national ownership um, in the sense that I think one of the more interesting things that has emerged um, recently, and it's only from last year, by the way, it's available online. Um, the Germans are amazing. Even when they have an important constitutional court judgment, it's immediately online in English, you know, so the whole world... Uh, <laughs> Um, can follow it, but also with this piece of legislation, which is actually um, important, and I think in many ways could be a model for other national parliaments. Um, it was also immediately and is available online in English, um, uh, well translated. Now, of course, people will say, oh, yes, but um, the Bundestag only... Um, uh, they only adopted this because the German constitutional court um, more or less said that they had to um, in an important judgment on um, the ESM uh, about two years ago. 
That may be the case, but nevertheless, if you look at uh, the information that the government is now obliged, and it's a legal obligation, um, they are uh, supplying a huge, having to supply a huge range of information to the German parliament in a way, I think, that is unmatched almost by any other parliament, perhaps the, fain the, the Finnish um, or the Danish, where they can directly access also the government database, might come close uh, in practice, but in terms of a legal obligation. And in terms of, of, of all the various actors, you know, because a lot of um, action at the European level is also at the informal uh, level, informal meetings, you know, there, um, and even the trialogue meetings that I referred to in the beginning, they're also, um, they're not regulated in the treaty. They don't have to take place. This is a practice that has evolved, an interinstitutional practice. Um, so in that sense, informal. And it covers very early stage um, meetings that are taking important decisions. So this means the engagement can be more what's known as upstream. So it can be earlier on um, rather than when it's too late, you know, when everything has more or less been um, decided. So again, this is part of my thesis um, that information is absolutely uh, crucial um, in this context. And of course, you know, um, I recognize, and, and some people will say quite rightly, these are not easy issues. There are no easy solutions. It's not a magic bullet. I'm not saying that at all. Um, because one of the problems is, well, this is all very well, but you know, we're already overloaded with everything we get from Europe. Do we want even more? And how are we going to process that? Um, and are we expert enough even to process that and, and, and all that sort of thing? I mean, these are issues that all national parliaments struggle with. In the Netherlands, it's exactly the same. Um, they're under-resourced. They don't have um, the staff to the research staff that can help in the analysis of, of, of this sort of thing. One of my, and so resources of national parliaments is really a hugely important issue in order to be able to exercise accountability in any kind of effective fashion. But I also believe that um, by publicity and um, can also help because if there are debates on the basis of public documents, then you can, you can take evidence or have witnesses or whatever, but also non-governmental organizations or whatever can express a view. They can point out certain risks. There can be some comparative work done in the public domain, uh, which I think is, is obviously important in, in matters that are um, of a huge public interest. And this is my last slide. Um, and so at the very end, we come back to, well, this is all very well, but um, what does this mean for the European Parliament, particularly uh, two weeks before the European parliamentary elections? So I'm not saying that the solution to the democratic deficit is reinforcing the role of national parliaments only because, in fact, traditionally, that would be regarded as a very reactionary um, um, position, um, certainly from within those who are, if you like, true believers of uh, the value of European integration, national parliaments are viewed as a kind of threat to the European um, integration process. But I suppose I'm, a, I'm a, what you might call a legal realist. I think we have to look at uh, what, is actually, what is the nature of European integration actually today? What is happening? Who are these actors? How do, the, how do they uh, perform their tasks? And then look at the role of various parliaments at various levels of governments, and that includes both the European Parliament and the, um, and the national parliament. And I just make two final concluding remarks, if I may. Um, one is that political leaders um, today in the context of the future of Europe debate, you know, including the British Prime Minister, but also the, the Dutch Prime Minister and others, when talking about the democratic deficit, they increasingly say, yes, we must have less of a role for the European Parliament and more of a role for the national parliaments. And then they go on very quickly to say, yes, it must be at a sort of, we'll set, set up a special 
um, new parliament that will be composed of members of the national parliaments and the European Parliament, you know, we'll have a Eurozone Parliament, or we'll reinforce COSAC. COSAC is already the interparliamentary entity, it's not an institution that, that already exists and that is quite weak. And my reaction to that is, well, this is, of course, what would suit very well the executive power because it will be completely unthreatening and weak. Um, so, and what we need, in fact, is that the national parliaments themselves take ownership nationally, but also act together more horizontally with one another um, at key moments in the process. Um, and I've, I've elsewhere argued, in fact, they should be disobedient, even disobedient, um, with regard to their government or even the supranational actors. There are, there are ways of forcing information out into the public domain and of engaging, of really challenging executive power. I mean, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. It's not easy. But there is something um, that is beginning, I think. Actually, I'm not, um, I'm not pessimistic in that, in that sense. I think something is happening and uh, that we will see uh, progress um, in that regard. And the other thing is the European Parliament. The European Parliament is, of course, also a crucial actor, not only in terms of legislation, but also in terms of holding the collectivity of power at the European level to some sort of account, to some sort of public debate, be it the European Parliament or increasingly the European Central Bank um, that itself proclaims that it's only accountable to uh, the European Parliament but not to the national level. In my, and this is coming back to what I opened with and also the remarks of Jean-Claude Trichet yesterday, um, that this is actually quite an old-fashioned view of because the European Central Bank has evolved enormously um, because of banking union and because of practices over the course of the past few years. So since the last uh, treaty and since the constitution, if you like, or the charter of the European Central Bank um, was set up. So I think it's, it's simply not correct to say that an entity such as the European Central Bank can be only responsible to the European Parliament, but also needs to be responsible to national parliaments and should be um, prepared to engage with a dialogue um, at that level as well. But there will be other areas, and these really are my final comments, where um, you can only envisage a supranational role uh, for the European Parliament. For example, with regard to international agreements um, and, and the engagement, um, because the European Parliament has the power to veto international agreements, so that implies that it must also engage in the process. Um, and as we know, there are um, incredibly important issues that are being dealt with at the level of international agreements. So not just uh, swift, like um, you know, the anti-terrorist um, international agreements and exchange of information, but also, for example, the US-EU uh, trade agreement that is currently under negotiation. So thank you very much, and I hope that I haven't overloaded you. Thank you.